Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. We are back with a new season and we have a new campaign to launch, an international campaign against militarism and imperialism. The two most important conflicts taking place in the world today are, of course, the war in Ukraine and the war in Gaza, the genocidal war by Israel against Gaza, which is at the heart of what threatens to be a wider conflict in the Middle East. But first, let me introduce our guest. He's a regular on the show. It's Hamid Alizadeh, who is a leading member of the Revolutionary Communist International. Hamid, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me, Fritjo. So before we get into the specifics of the war in Ukraine and the war of the Middle East, we seem to be living through a period of war, revolution, and counter-revolution. I mean, in the last few months, we've seen revolutionary movements in Bangladesh, in Kenya. So on the one hand, you have this intensifying class struggle, but you also have this increasing belligerence by the imperialists with dire implications for people all over the world. And if you look at history it seems that these things often go together. War and revolution tend to be two sides of the same coin. Uh, is that a fair comment? I think so. And in fact, I think rather than an introduction, it's probably the conclusion of, of, this, uh, of this podcast. And of course, it's related to the fact that, uh, that, we have a, that capitalism is experiencing a very, very deep crisis. And this crisis is not only weighing, it's not only increasing the tension between the classes, but it's also increasing the tensions between the different capitalist classes, the different ruling classes uh, uh, around uh, the world. Yeah, and obviously you can see how different capitalists, different countries are being dragged in various ways into these conflicts we're going to talk about. And we'll deal with them in turn. And I think we should start with the Middle East, because just as we went to sit down and record this episode, there was a dramatic new development in Lebanon. There was, we'll call it by its name, because the Western press won't, there was a mass terrorist attack that was carried out by the Israeli um, secret services, almost certainly, where pages being carried around busy cities and towns, they were sabotaged and they exploded and over two and a half thousand people were wounded. Uh, I think nine people have been confirmed dead, including a 10-year-old child. This attack, where you had thousands of pages exploding everywhere, it wasn't, it was, it was an indiscriminate attack mm. in reality. Uh, you know, on a sidewalk, in some shop, in someone's home, uh, thousands of people have been severely, uh, you know, seriously injured. As far as I know, 12 people have died so far, right. confirmed. Two of those are children. One of them is a health worker. Um, and if it, this had been, let's say, something that had happened in a Western country, we know what would have happened. It would have been, uh, the press would have been up in arms. All of the politicians would have been uh, up in arms. Uh, and... If this was happened to Israel, let's say all of them would be howling and screaming in support of Israel yeah. and in support of his fight uh, against uh, Hezbollah to the to, to to the bitter end. Yeah, thousands of pages blew up in Tel Aviv, and two children were killed, and thousands of people were wounded. It would be decried as terrorism, a war crime. If Russia had done this to yeah. uh, civilian population in Ukraine, there would have been the same condemnation. But I've seen all sorts of commentary from the Western press and from Zionists in the West and prominent pro-Israeli commentators celebrating this as an ingenious precision strike yeah. that was actually very humane because it only targeted yeah. Hezbollah operatives. That's, that's, I mean, that's the callousness. And uh, to go even further is that <clears throat> what is what are the what is the West said? Mm. And uh, the main thing that Western governments have come out and said was to urge Iran to show restraint. Mm-hmm. I mean, the White House, uh, the spokesman of, of, of the White House said that they were um, urging Iran not to take advantage of this incident and try to add uh, and not to try to add further uh, instability to the tensions in the, in the region. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, if you just stop and, and think about this for, for a moment. This is really insane because who is it that's adding to instability? You have here not Iran and Hezbollah and Lebanon and these so-called terrorist organizations, which, which they are called, that are uh, attacking innocent people in indiscriminately killing Westerners or Israelis or anything like that. What you have is a 
serious operation, an indiscriminate operation, and is and they're gloating about it. Yes, they're gloating about this. And what you have also is a, a prime minister Benjamin Netanyahu in uh, in uh, in Israel, who openly is doing everything in his power to not just add to the tensions, not just to have more instability in the region, but to drag the whole of the region into a war. That's open. Everyone knows this. Well, let's talk about, about this, this question of provocation and how Iran has to um, show restraint. What's happened over the course of the last few months? Most recently, Israel assassinated one of Hamas's top guys, um, Ismail Haniyeh, in Iran, in yeah. an act that was intended as a humiliation yeah. for Iran. Mm -hmm. And straight away, the first thing the Americans in particular were saying, but also the British governments, all the governments in the West say, oh, Iran must show restraints. Yeah. I mean, the only government really refusing to show restraints in the course of this situation has been Israel. Iran's actually exactly. show quite significant restraints. Exactly. Because Imagine, so far, it's done nothing. Nothing obvious. Imagine what would happen if... Uh, Iran bombed the American embassy in Israel. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of restraint would we be? Yeah, would I'm, sure, we be I'm sure Biden, talking? Harris, and Blinken yeah. would show great restraints. But the point is, the main point is, see, that's all fluff mm -hmm. because the main point that is not being discussed, mm -hmm. and that's why we're running this campaign, is what what is happening here. Uh, it's clear that the war in Gaza has been lost. Right. Like they, there's been fighting. For a whole year, mm. they've been inflicting unprecedented death and destruction on this poor, defenseless people. Because that's what that's what they are. Uh, tens of thousands of people have been killed, upwards to to fifty thousand probably now. Many, many more have been injured and maimed. Many, many more have lost everything. Uh, become these 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 refugees within their own prison really, because that's what Gaza is, a, a massive open-air prison. And uh, with no help, with no support, uh, no defense. And nevertheless, Israel has not managed to win or gain any of its uh, war aims. Mm. Hamas has not been destroyed. In fact, a whole new generation is now being prepped to enter into the ranks of Hamas, not just in Gaza, but also in the West Bank. We don't have the figures, we don't have the data, but it's clear to me, and I think we'll see that in the future, that the bulk of the youth in the West Bank, if not, if they're not moving towards Hamas, then they're definitely moving, they're being hardened, and they're moving into a very, very militant stance. So far from stabilizing the situation, destroying Hamas, guaranteeing peace for Israel, what they've managed to do is to strengthen Hamas and guarantee instability uh, for the duration of, of for many 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 years uh, to come, uh, but the problem is this: Netanyahu cannot accept that he cannot end this war because he's got his own problems. He's got a whole series of corruption charges against him. He got a an, a, a capitalist class, the bulk of which inside of Israel is opposed to him. A huge part of the population hates him and wants him out. And everyone knows that as soon as this war ends, Netanyahu is out. Yes. So for his own extremely narrow reasons, he is intent on, on broadening the war to, to, to Lebanon and most importantly to Iran. Mm. And that's the insane thing that no one is talking about. Uh, that he's been provoking Iran. He's been bombing their embassy. Right. And what is this about? You know, this is not just because. Iran is a threat. Iran is not a threat to Israel as it as it stands uh, now, but it's but it's because Iran is a formidable opponent. is the only Middle Eastern nation that has been able to challenge Israeli uh, domination and Israeli imperialism. And uh, the Israelis know that if they pull Iran into a war, it wouldn't just be Iran. First of all, it would be Iran. It would be Iraq. It would be Yemen. It would be Lebanon. It would be uh, Syria. And pro it, this would also destabilize all the other countries in, in the whole region. And it would force the United States to come to the defense of Israel as its last 
firm bastion in, in, in the region. And that's what they really, he really wants. He wants the Americans to enter this war to save him. Mm. But in order to save himself, he's now you know, planning to pull the whole region into, into a war. And also just to add that, you know, Iran is not just any country. First of all, it's a very strong military and there's by no means guaranteed that the Israelis would win a war against Iran. To the contrary, I think probably it's more likely that the Iranians would win. But that's besides the matter. Israel is a nuclear uh, uh, nuclear state. And Iran is most probably what you call a nuclear threshold state, which mm. means that they have everything needed to build a bomb, nuclear bomb. But they and they could do it within a matter of weeks and or maybe a couple of months if they were impeded in in one way or another. So, what does it mean? This means that they want to pull uh, these mighty forces into these extremely dangerous forces into an all-out war. And behind Iran, obviously, is Russia, is China, and Netanyahu doesn't care at all. Doesn't care at all. Um, that's the insane thing. That no one is mentioning this. No one is, me- and everyone knows it. People even say, "Oh yes, it's clear." You know, you read the papers, you read the Economist, the Guardian, all of the New York Times. Say, "Oh yes, Netanyahu is clearly intent on expanding the war into Lebanon because, as you know, if he doesn't do that, he will lose power and he will go to prison, and so on and so forth." It's quite a flippant and easy thing to say, but if you think about the implications of that, what would a wider conflagration in the Middle East mean? Not just for the people in the, caught in the crossfire, but for the workers and poor of the world. So we saw the impact of the Ukraine war on energy prices, on shopping bills, yeah. the damage it caused to the world economy, the misery it exacted upon millions upon millions of households. What would a wider war in the Middle East mean? Well, I mean, you know that a huge uh, chunk of the oil of the world comes from the Middle East. Right. And uh, on top of that, obviously, you have Russia at war under sanctions. So you will have a whole, the, the a, a enormous part of the oil and en- energy uh, of the world being, coming from areas which are under war and, and extreme instability. That in itself, it would be enough to, to destabilize the world economy. You have the... Um, what do you call it? The Suez Canal, which goes through the Middle East, that that would be under uh, under threat. You have the Yemenis who can who are threatening the traffic that goes towards that 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 canal. You can have enormous instability spreading throughout the world economy, but it would also destabilize one regime after another. And we have to also remember that uh, you know war is a, is not something you can always control. Mm. It's just. You know, all of these countries, Iranians, have very long-range missiles. If you pull in America into a war in the Middle East, it doesn't mean that the war would remain in the Middle East. Right. <laughs> you know, and uh, and it, it, it's, a, it's a completely uncontrollable situation. Now, we're not saying this is what's going to happen necessarily, but that's the, 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 what we want to highlight is that is what Netanyahu wants. And the West... U.S. imperialism and all of their puppets in London and in, in other in Paris and in other places are giving him a blank check. Yeah. And anyone who opposes it, anyone who cries out and says, "Hold up, let's give it a thought," is immediately labeled as an anti-Semite mm-hmm. and is either shut down by being ignored or or, or sanctioned or one way uh, or another. Well, let's look at the last few months. Let's look at the wave of student encampments that we saw break out in solidarity with Gaza, with solidarity with the Palestinians, the principal demand of those student encampments, those student uh, protests being that their universities divest from, from, from Israel. Um, you know, these are, these are kids, these are educated kids in some of the most important centers of learning in some of the most advanced capitalist countries, you know, universities like Harvard and Yale, universities in the UK, um, like, like UCL and, and Cambridge and Oxford, you know, in, in societies that are supposed to be democratic, societies mm. that are supposed to value democratic values like free speech. And yet what happened? They made this demand and they were immediately uh, attacked legally. They were attacked in the press. They yeah. faced expulsion. They faced sanction from the universities and they were beaten up and attacked by police, by campus security, yeah. and also by Zionist goons who set up shop outside the encampments yeah. and were deliberately sent in as shock troops. So anybody who 
questions the policy of their ruling classes in supporting Israel or who opposes Israel's war um, face terrible consequences in the West. Yeah, democratic rights, you know, free speech, freedom to organize, Mm. uh, all of these things are clearly only uh, available to you as long as you don't step over the limits put in front of you by the ruling class. Right. And as long as you don't move against the interests of the ruling class. Mm. See, what's interesting here is that the politicians in the West are blindly following is one on the, they're, they're willing to pay this price. Mm. One of destabilizing their own countries and destabilizing the whole world of dragging one of the most important, you know, kind of n- nodal points in the world economy and in world politics into a, a devast, potentially devastating war. For what? For the most immediate, narrow, uh, narrow, uh, interests, uh, whatsoever of maintaining relationships of, you know, in the case of Biden, of, Buying favor with the, the, the Israeli Zionist lobby, for instance, or this and that, and of not being seen to be weak, mm. <laughs> for example, this is complete lunacy. And they're dragging the whole world uh, down with them. And they, and they, and they, they, they're destabilizing the system. They're destabilizing their own system. Yes. And obviously the cost of that, the bill for that is going to be presented to the workers and poor all around the world. Mm, we'll come to some of the specifics and some of the actual figures included in that bill in a moment. So obviously, this is a tinderbox situation in the Middle East. Netanyahu is, is hell-bent on keeping the fighting going, as you say. It seems like we're always on the knife edge of war breaking out, of a wide war breaking out in the Middle East. Um, there's all these hopeful reports in the press every time there seems to be a breakthrough in negotiation between Israel and Hamas and it seems like they're going to stitch something up but then at the last minute uh, Netanyahu and it's always Netanyahu Mm -hmm. throws something into the mix to prevent that from happening he'll put in some sort of condition which is unacceptable to Hamas obviously unacceptable or he'll have the chief negotiator from the other side assassinated which isn't the kind of thing you do if you're seriously interested in peace so, is there going to be an escalation? Is a wider war in the Middle East inevitable at this point? Well, time will tell, but uh, certainly the Iranians don't want it. They are trying to calm things down and stabilize things. The Americans don't seem to really the want Americans it. The Americans don't really want it. They don't want a wider, wider war. Um, Hamas certainly wants peace they've signed already si- they've already reached agreement on a ceasefire deal and uh for an exchange for hostages a, a long time ago and the hezbollah doesn't want want a war <laughs> the Syrians don't want a war the iraqis don't want a war the egyptians don't want a war no one wants a war in israel the army officers high-ranking army officers who come out says we've we've lost the war in gaza and you know, Hezbollah is an entirely different kettle of fish. We shouldn't do this. The ruling class in Israel, the majority, the bulk of the ruling class in Israel don't want a war. None of these people want a, a, an outright war with the, with Iran. But uh, Netanyahu is determined. Netanyahu needs a war. Mm. But what is insane is that the Americans and the West are not are not putting a stop to him. But why is that? How is it that one guy in a relatively small country can completely defy the broader interests of the most powerful imperialist nations? You know, people who, if they wanted to, tomorrow could just cut off the flow of weapons and say, no, enough is enough. This isn't worth it. It's costing us a fortune and all of our public hate us. It's causing instability. You're going to risk a wider war that will wreck the global economy, which is only just coming into some sort of equilibrium yeah. for now. Stop. Not No more. You can't do this. And, and yet it seems like the tail is always wagging the dog. How do we explain this? How can Netanyahu dictate to basically everybody else that there should be a wider war, whether they like it or not? Because they're mad. (laughs) It's as simple as that. That is why. Just irrational people. (laughs) Exactly. In particular, the Americans. In particular, Joe Biden. 
you know, he he when the seventh uh, of October attack happened, and it was clear that Netanyahu was going to go all in in uh, in Gaza. Mm. What did Biden do? He could have sent, you know, a message of condolences, and he, he could, could have asked Netanyahu to show restraints. He could have done he what could, they've done, what <laughs> exactly. they've done repeatedly to the exactly. Iranians, for example. Well, they do, and from now and then they have started calling for for restraint. But what she did was that he came down, he hugged Netanyahu, he threw his full weight behind him, stupidly, mm. and he tied his fate to Netanyahu. Now. What is it? Biden is in a... The Democrats are in an election period. Right. And they they stupidly think that it's bad for them to call it quits uh, and admit that they made a mistake. Right. I mean, no one really knows what the, what's going on in Joe Biden's mind. I don't Including think jo- Joe Biden. I think Joe Biden doesn't know what's going on in Joe Biden's mind. But that's the level that we're talking about. And that's, the, that, that, that's where you see the real... Um, depth of the crisis of the system mm. is that these are the people you have at the top they're mad they're gambling with the security and safety of the whole world for very very short-sighted individual gains mm. and obsessions that's the other thing uh, because you know there's, there's an obsession with iran from a big part of the ruling class in the u.s and there's an obsession with supporting Israel uh, against Iran uh, in many ways. There's also the fact that the U.S. has lost a huge amount of influence throughout the Middle East. Mm. Um, in Iraq, they're only present uh, on the mercy of the Iranians, essentially. Right. In uh, in the rest of the Gulf states, you know, Iran has hundreds of thousands of battle-hardened militiamen throughout the Middle East. Uh, in Syria, they defeated the Americans and their proxies. In uh, Lebanon, the Saudi and the American, you know, uh, supported uh, groups are now uh, completely out of the picture. Whereas Hezbollah is the main political force in the country. In Yemen, the Saudi regime supported and and its and its uh, proxies supported by the Americans and Brits were defeated by the by the Houthis. And in fact, Saudi Arabia itself has now made a deal with Iran. Is there's a there's a uh, how do you say approximation between the two, which means that the influence of the Americans in the Middle East has seen se- severely decreased. In uh, Turkey is now more and more with the BRICS countries, with Iran, with Russia, with China, and the only firm foothold that the Americans have in the region is Israel. Mm. Is Israel, and in their minds, in the minds of people like Biden, who do not who are incapable of thinking ahead, that is enough. In order to save that foothold, uh, they think they need to throw everything behind what Netanyahu says. They cannot yeah. show any division or any... And in reality, it's become kind of the other... Way. They are supposed... Israel is supposed to be a vassal state. It's supposed to be a minor puppet of the Americans, but it's become the opposite. Mm. And that's something we often see when you know we're at the height or towards the decline of the uh, Ottoman Empire, for example, right. you saw these vassal states getting more and more independent-minded and increasingly rebelling and trying to force the hands of the central government. This is something also we see here is a, is a, is a crisis of U.S. imperialism, yeah. essentially. And, of course, the fact that the U.S. imperialists are not prepared to cut Israel loose means that there are literally no crimes that Israel can commit that are beyond the pale. In spite of all of the bleating we hear, particularly in relation to the uh, Ukraine war and the things that Russia is accused of doing, uh, real and imagined, no matter how many children Israel blows to pieces, no matter how many thousands of pieces of civilian infrastructure it destroys, no matter how many uh, cities and towns Israel levels, no matter how many innocent people it kills, it doesn't matter. There are no crimes that it can't get away with. Yeah. The other day, an American citizen was shot in the head by an IDF soldier in the West Bank, actually the third American citizen to have been killed um, in the West Bank since the 7th of October. And Biden-Harris, I think they said something to the effect of, oh, well, that's that's not on, that's not very nice, but we'll wait for the IDF's investigation basically trusting the Israeli army to investigate itself and determine that there was no wrongdoing. We've seen this story so many times. The 
stinking hypocrisy of these people to dare to lecture us about rule of law, about international law, about, you know, good Western values. And they are not only allowing, but facilitating some of the most horrific war crimes and acts of terrorism um, in living memory. Yeah. And, you know, they talk about uh, Putin. You know, there's so many comparisons between Putin and Hitler. They have all these psychological, especially in the beginning of the Ukraine war, they would do these psychoanalyses of Putin and how he's a psychopath and yeah. how he was a yeah, narcissist. Yeah, cancer as well. And he was senile. All, he, it was a all body sorts double of that things, was the other you know, Putin. All sorts of things. Or when they talk about the Iranian regime, you know, yeah. the mullahs in Iran, oh, they're terrible. They're these feudal, backward, uh, uh, you know, barbarians. I mean, we don't support Putin or we don't support the Iranian regime, but... Who is the irrational one here and who is the rational one? Right. Who are these people are dragging us into a potentially devastating conflict uh, which could threaten the whole of the world's instability? And if it wasn't for the extreme caution and rationality shown by the Iranians and by the Russians, we would already have been there. Yeah. That's the problem. Who Who is it that's as you say, indiscriminately murdering tens of thousands of men, women, and children. And who is supporting them? You know, who is it that's, that's, that's just trying to spread as much death, destruction, and mayhem as possible? Mm. And who is supporting them? It's all on the West. It's all on U.S. imperialism. It's all on Israeli imperialism. And it's all on the, on, on, on the Europeans as well, who are obviously small-time puppets, but nevertheless, they are part of the same camp. Well, we started talking about Putin and the small-time European puppets, so it feels like a good time to move on to the question of Ukraine. And this was brought back to the spotlight after a period where I think you could say it was sort of simmering in the background. Obviously, the invasion launched in February of 2022, came with this massive explosion of propaganda in the press and huge adulation for Ukraine and tens of billions of dollars worth of aid and weapons thrown into into the theatre of war to support the Ukrainian war effort. Um, in the last period, I think even some of the densest skulls in the West are being penetrated with the reality that things aren't going particularly well in Ukraine. Um, there was um, an incursion, an attempted incursion into Kursk, which ended in disaster, or is ending in disaster, and the Russians are advancing inexorably in the Eastern Theatre in the Donbass. But um, it, there was an escalation, or the threat of an escalation, a couple of weeks ago, where Zelensky, recognizing this, went to Biden, went to the West, and pleaded for permission to use long range missiles like the US Attackham system and the Anglo French Storm Shadow deep in Russian territory. And Putin said that if he was given permission for this, this would be tantamount to a declaration of war. So I wondered if you could just explain the significance of um, this question of the long-range missiles in Russian territory. Why did Putin say that if you give Ukraine permission to do this, you're effectively declaring war on Russia? Well, the point is that um, these are missiles that um, cannot be con- that cannot be fired and operated without the direct involvement of of the west that you need gps navigation and intelligence and coordination by western countries in order to carry out these strikes so that would mean that the west is directly participating in striking deep into russian territory and they know that this is a a red line you know um but uh, again, what we have here is this you know, slight insanity, not slight, real insanity, Total insanity, that this is just being discussed. This is just being discussed openly. Oh, yes, should we give the Ukrainian storm shadow missiles, allow them to, to shoot into, uh, into Russia or not? And um, for now, they haven't given them permission. They might do that in the future. I, I don't know about that. Um, and uh, they casually say, no, Putin doesn't have any red lines. Don't worry about it. That's what some of them are doing. Um, Boris Johnson, the, he's been out uh, along with five former defense secretaries, I, I believe. 
say that oh we should uh, the the Britain should allow uh, the Ukrainians to use the storm shadow missiles even if the Americans don't want it. Yeah, and which it, I think it, is impossible actually. I think that even with storm shadow, you need U.S. Um, buy-in as well. That might be that might be the case. I I, I don't know about that, but again, it shows the insanity of it. The the world's biggest nuclear power because that's what russia is mm. is telling you in quite no uncertain words that this is a line you cannot cross this is too much and this means a declaration of war which means that it's fair game for us to attack western assets mm. if you shoot this we can shoot down your satellites we can shoot down anywhere and this is the, the, a declar- an open declaration of war and that you then keep pushing for this is is madness mm. is madness now all of this is obviously the 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 main <laughs> root how do you say where this comes from the the source of all of this is zelensky the president of ukraine who realizes that the war in ukraine is lost mm. it's lost um it's been lost for a long time but now it's becoming increasingly clear. Out of desperation, they made this incursion into Kursk. They gained, you know, some square kilometers, uh, which are completely inconsequential, to be honest, uh, in it from a military point of view. But what's then happened is that everywhere else, their front lines are beginning to collapse. They are now moved. They, they had a collapsing front line around Pokrovsk. Which is a key distribution hub in uh, in the Donbas. They move some troops there. They uh, temporarily stabilized the front there, but now other front lines are collapsing up uh, towards Kupiansk in in the further north towards uh, Kharkiv, um, the Chasavyar direction, the Sivers direction, the um, the Ukledar direction further south. The whole front line is. On the brink of collapsing and the Russian, the Russian gains are faster and faster and bigger and bigger in size. In fact, even though the Ukrainians occupied uh, a thousand square kilometers, some people say, in, uh, inside of Russia in the month of, I believe it was, was it August and September? Mm-hmm. Um, in those two months, the Russians still managed to gain more than the ukrainians mm. that's how much the russians uh, russians gained so the war is ro- is lost and the only solution that the only card that zelensky has left because he's in a similar state position as as netanyahu you can say he's not that popular and he does not stand a good chance of survival and he doesn't basically doesn't have very good future prospects once the war if, if the war ends and he loses um he hasn't had. He, he's he's an unelected president. His term ran out in May. He's been exp- expanding it by just calling a um, uh, what is it called martial law, yeah, like emergency, emergency powers, emergency powers, and um, and he's losing and he's losing more and more every day. This this offensive in Kursk actually proved to be the opposite of a good thing. It actually became a trap for for the Ukrainians. Because the plan, I think, was to draw Russian troops away from the Donbass, but. It, well, fail. that's what they say. That's I don't think I, no one knows what plans they had. I think it was just. I think, uh, yeah, that might have been part of the plan. But I think it was a PR stunt, mm. and it was a stunt aimed at crossing Russia's red lines. Yes, which it was. It was a red line. Russia always said, "You do not enter internationally recognized uh, borders of, of, of Russia." That's what, and that's what Zelensky has been doing the whole time. And the only purpose with this is what? Is to pull the West into this war. And he says this openly. The West should come. Russia has no red lines. Don't worry about it. And the West, the, the insane thing is again that the West, Western politicians know this. Hmm. There is a, I saw there's a, there's an article by Gideon Rachman where he, he refers to a new biography about Biden. Where he says to someone, to one of his aides, oh, Zelensky wants to pull us into World War III. They know this. And yet, every time, they follow along. Why? Why is that? Well, because they don't want to admit defeat. Yeah. In particular, for Biden, it's because he's obsessed with this war mm. and he's tied his reputation to it. And uh, 
they know they're being dragged into this conflict. They know that they're being dragged towards World War Three, which it would eventually be between the two biggest nuclear powers and the two biggest military powers on the planet. Mm. And they are just going along with Zelensky at every step. They're letting themselves get dragged along. Now, it's true that apparently about these long-range missiles, they have they've said stop. They don't want to go along. And it's clear that some people within the U.S., at the top in the U.S., uh, realize that this is going too far and the war is lost. They need to find some solution. But there are still forces that play, play the other way. And they still support the, the Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians are keep pushing them in this, uh, in this uh, direction. And it's not just one red line that they, they've continuously crossed Russia's red lines. Right. And they keep, and they keep uh, uh, crossing it. And yeah. they might do it again in the Yeah, next Zelensky time. goes asking for long range weapons. The West says no. Then it says yes. Yeah. Ask for tanks. The West says no. Then they say yes. Exactly. Uh, ask for F- F- F-16s. It yes. says no. Then it says yes. yes. Exactly. So, I mean, there, there was, there was some talk that, um, the decision might have been deferred to the UN, um, General Assembly, uh, in about a week's time. But I guess we'll see. But on this question of madness and doing something that is deeply contrary to your own interests and the interests of hundreds of millions of people around the world, the Americans are one thing, but I think that the British ruling class are an exceptional case when it comes to madness because, as you say, there are some voices in in the American ruling class that are clearly pulling in the other direction. Mm. But um, we've got a new government in Britain bit like new boss, same as the old boss. Yeah. Um, Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, at the yeah. head of the right-wing Labour Party, more or less continuing Tory policy on everything that you can name, from attacking the working class, attacking unions, maintaining support for Israel's genocide in Gaza. But now, um, distinguishing himself, I think, Keir Starmer, in just how belligerent and just how irresponsibly insane he's behaving. I mean, yeah. he went down to the US, went down to Washington with um, David Lammy, and put himself at the absolute forefront of begging Joe Biden to allow Zelensky to cross Putin's red line, uh, yeah. to... Uh, agree to a policy that Putin has said in no uncertain terms would amount to a declaration of war by NATO against Russia. He was told no. Um, he was embarrassed. Um, I, I think that it's clear that he was partly thinking about his own legacy and his own position as a statesman. He wanted to make a, a big stamp on world politics and foreign affairs, and he wanted to show that Britain was taking the lead on this question. Um but Biden told him absolutely not, at least for now. And then he went off to Italy, off to France, off to Germany, in part to lobby for support for this policy of acquiescing to Zelensky's demands. So can we just take a minute to talk about the the lunacy of the British ruling class in particular, these people who act like they're still important, who's, who act like they're still like a major imperialist power, still have an empire, still have any real significant say in, in world affairs. How do we explain the psychology of the British ruling class? Well, I think it's what you say, is, is people who act like they still have an empire when they're actually complete, completely inconsequential for world politics. Uh, and they have nothing. You have this letter again by Boris Johnson and these other mm. uh, other Tory. I think it's Tory or former former defense secretaries. Um, Ed Davy as well, I think, from the Lib Dems. Right. Yes. And um, what does it represent? It represents a tiny, tiny nation with megalomania and with a totally decrepit ruling class who believe that. By doing this, they somehow, by sending weapons and showing that they, you know, throwing their weight around, the tiny, tiny weight around, they can somehow have an impact and matter in world politics. Whereas in reality, they only serve one purpose, which is to serve U.S. imperialism. Mm. That's the only purpose they, they, they serve. Then the, the American used them in order to push through this, this war in, in, in Ukraine. They used them to destabilize, to split. Uh, you know, to intervene in the EU and destabilize the, 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 the EU. They use them for whatever they need. They use them in the Iraq war, in the Afghanistan war. But now, when as they go out and try to 
kind of play an independent role. Obviously, they're getting slapped down and told to behave and, and know their uh, know their place. But clearly, this little puppy, Vikia Stama, doesn't really know know his place. And I know that we've spoken a few times about the way that the, this current crisis-ridden state of capitalism has revealed the sham of uh, democracy under capitalist rule. Keir Starmer is unilaterally making probably the most consequential decision that you can possibly make as a world leader, threatening World War III. He didn't ask Parliament. He didn't talk to the public. He just did this without consulting anybody. I mean, what's the point of democracy if a leader can unilaterally decide to risk plunging the world into the hell of nuclear war? Well, that is that is a bourgeois democracy, is you being allowed to elect someone who can do whatever they want for the next four years. Mm. <laughs> and, and, uh, and besides that, all of the main levers of power are elsewhere, are not in parliament anyway. But that is, that is the limits of, of bourgeois democracy, obviously. I want to talk a little bit about the cost of war, because there's a few different ways of talking about this. Um, in terms of the cost measured in human life, again, just as we were sitting down, the Wall Street Journal released an article where in a rare instance it claimed to have accurate figures of the war dead in Ukraine. And this is something that Zelensky and Kiev have been very careful about um, keeping under wraps because morale's bad enough and they don't want to be honest about how many people they've lost. And I don't suspect these figures are accurate either because they'll almost certainly exaggerate the Russian losses and minimize the Ukrainian losses. But nevertheless, they estimate that a million people have been killed or or um, or wounded. So there's been a million war casualties. They put it at 80,000 troops dead on the Ukrainian side and 400,000 wounded and about 200,000 dead and uh, 400,000 wounded on the Russian side. I... Don't doubt that the Ukrainian dead are far higher, but even if this is accurate, that would be horrifying. These are catastrophic losses, and there's stories abounding, you know, that you appear in the Western press, so, so I'm inclined to believe them, that talk about recruitment agents in Ukraine going to nightclubs and like dragging young men by the collar off to almost certain death on the front people fleeing across the border, over the mountains, risking their lives, leaving everything behind, their families, their homes, to get away, uh, just collapsing morale all along the line. So there's that side of it. There's the um, the cost of blood. But also there's the, there's the financial cost. I was trying to get decent figures on what the war in Ukraine has cost the world so far. And... One figure I came across, about 1.5 trillion that's been spent on Ukraine so far. Of that, the Americans from January 2022, so before the war broke out, broke out by helping to build Ukraine up, to June this year, has spent on military aid alone. So this isn't reconstruction, this is explicitly guns, ammunition, military aid, about $57 billion. Um, Germany has spent 10 billion euros, um, the UK 13 billion pounds. And this is, again, this is just arms. This is just weapons. These are eye-watering sums of money, and they're committed to billions more for the next several years. At the same time, our ruling classes tell us there's no money. They tell us they can't afford, for example, in Britain to maintain the winter fuel allowance for pensioners. And they say that by cutting it, they'll save one or two billion pounds. They've already spent over 13 billion pounds on military aid for Ukraine. So apparently they can't afford to keep pensioners alive through the freezing winter, but they can afford to spend money perpetuating a war that has already lost and that risks the ultimate consequence for the world, i.e. a direct clash between nuclear armed powers. How can anybody look at this and say that we live under a sane system? I think we need to go back to what you started with, to be honest, before we, we, we address the last bit, which is that, um, you see, this war was always uh, presented as a just war for democracy, the Ukraine war. That it was in defense of the Ukrainian people's rights against these Russian aggressors 
And Russia is constantly, obviously, portrayed as this evil aggressor. But in reality, it was not Russia. And they always say, oh, the unprovoked, the unprovoked invasion of, of Ukraine mm. by Russia. But this war was not started by Russia. Mm. And anyone who just cares to look a little bit of what actually happened here realizes that this conflict, first of all, goes way back before 2024, uh, 22. Um, and it is, is, it was, was, it was not provoked by Russia. To the contrary, it was provoked by the Americans and it was provoked in order to weaken Russia on purpose. And I mean, let's hear it from the horse's mouth. I brought a, a quote by Mitt Romney, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, a U.S. politician says, Putin's Russia is not our friend and it is, uh, it is Russia's, it's not our friend and it's Russia's, it's China's most powerful ally. Supporting Ukraine weakens an adversary, enhances our national security advantage and requires no shedding of American blood. Mm. That's what this war is about. The, it was clear from the beginning that NATO, Russia could not accept a, a NATO base, i.e. a NATO, uh, Ukraine to be a, be a NATO country. What is NATO? NATO is a military alliance, uh, which is controlled by U.S. imperialism. There's nothing defensive about it. It's an offensive imperialist military, U.S. based military uh, alliance. That's what it is. And to have Ukraine as a member of NATO means a declaration of war against Russia. Ukraine is is not Russia, but is highly integrated into Russia. Mm. It's culturally, a, the Ukrainian and the Russian people are a, a, a brotherly people. They have the same culture, a, a lot of, they share a lot of the same culture, the same history. Russians and Ukrainians live on both sides. They travel. Ukraine was a very popular travel destination for, for, for ordinary Russians and vice versa. There is an economic integration. There is a military integration from the, from the Soviet Union. There's a 2000 kilometer, very, very porous border where, as I said, people just go, people live on the different sides of it and as if there was, it was nothing it was, with no problems. To have a, a NATO, uh, an aggressive, anti-Russian, hostile regime, a member of NATO on Russia's border, that is a direct threat, military threat, an existential threat to Russia. Mm-hmm. It would be the same as if Russia or China started engaged in a military alliance with Mexico or Canada, Canada is better, and began moving... Uh, heavy uh, military equipment, potentially even nuclear warheads, and building bases all over the Canadian. The Americans could never accept that. Mm. And America knew that Russia could never accept Ukraine to be a part of NATO. And in fact, they didn't have an intention of allowing Ukraine to be a part of it. When you heard them talk about it, there were never, never an actual intention of doing it. Mm. But they refused to give Russia that insurance. Then what they, what they also did was that they were complicit in the 2014 coup in, in Ukraine, which overthrew a president, which was more or less neutral, but faced both towards Russia and, and the West, and instead installed this extremely hostile anti-Russian regime, and then began to reorganize the Ukrainian army along NATO lines, mm. i.e. NATO instructors were sent to Ukraine, training up tens of thousands of officers, and uh, and so on and so forth. Now, the Russians took all of that, but said, "Look, NATO is the a, a, a red line. That was the, uh, Putin's red line." And he said, "If you cro- if we need assurances that you will not bring you, uh, Ukraine into NATO, and they refused to do it." For the reasons that Mitt Romney says, because they wanted to provoke a war, they thought this would be an easy war. It's going to be fought by who? By the Ukrainians. Ukrainian blood is going to be, not American blood, and, and it's going to keep Russia busy, and then we can focus on China. This was a stupid, simplistic way that they thought. And, the, and every time there was a chance of peace, they sabotaged it. Recently, Boris Johnson has been out boasting that he wrecked the peace, the peace deal that was, uh, that was uh, prepared in Istanbul, where the, the Russians and they can't come to an agreement. And he flew down to Kiev and he disrupted it. Yeah, this was in like April 2022. Yes. I mean, how many thousands of people have died yeah. since then? Yes. 
And every t- and every time since then, they've sabotaged any rapprochement. And what has it led to? It, it's led to, as you say, those figures, first of all, are heavy underestimations. Mm. Hundreds of thousands of dead, maybe more than a million uh, maimed and wounded and, you know, victims of uh, PTSD, things that aren't even counted in these kind of statistics, mm. damaged for life. Millions of people's uh, being being driven out of their homes, out of their livelihoods. Millions of people having to flee out of their countries, being refugees in in, in Europe. The whole of the infrastructure is destroyed. Eighty percent of the power grid is destroyed. Whole cities leveled to the ground. Um, whole regions now are going to be mined for generations. This is not going to be something easy to to you know, millions and millions of mines that are lying in in, in Ukrainian uh, ground. You know, a whole generation whose future and whose lives has been completely uh, destroyed be- because the West was pushing this to drain Ukraine off the last drop of blood. And Boris Johnson is uh, recently was he said that, oh, no, no, they can keep fighting. Don't worry. Give them, the, give them the storm shadow missiles. And then he said, oh, yes. And they don't worry. They can keep fighting because the mobilization age is above 25. They can just lower it. I, yes, we've killed everyone above 25. But we can just keep lowered until the age of 18. There's there's plenty of more young people to yeah. go through before we have to and call Then you can lower it to 16, lower it to 15, send the kids, send the little kids to of go course. die once they've run out of And what's happened? What's men. happened is Ukraine has, has run out of, Ukraine has run out of men. Hmm. The men are, are trying to flee. Whoever's being drafted in, there's, 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 uh, there's an uproar against mobilization. There are guards, mobilization forces that roam the streets and charge on buses and all sorts of places and uh, try to uh, uh, arrest and forcibly bring people uh, into the army. 200 mobilization vehicles have been burnt down, so much that the mobilization forces have to actually go around in uh, anonymous cars. Mm. But then those are being attacked. Any state-owned car, public-owned car is being attacked. So the state has made these stickers which which says we are not mobilization forces. That's not suspicious at all. That's not suspicious. <laughs> I mean, if they are, let's say, the ambulances. Yeah, yeah. But then they also use those. So um, anyway, but the point is, is completely the, the the country's economy has been completely destroyed. Ukraine is in, in a default. It's not paying off its debts. Right. It's got the biggest budget deficit anywhere in the world. The IMF is now demanding cuts and uh, tax hikes, uh, which is going to hit the poorest. And many, many people, we don't know how many, but probably soon a majority, if not a majority now, many millions of Ukrainians want peace. It doesn't mean they support Russia, but they say, we have lost. Yeah. Why do we keep fighting? And the only people who want this to go on is Zelensky, the right-wing nationalists and the, the, you know, the, the, the military fanatics at the top, and then the Americans and the people in the West who keep funding this war for their own narrow... Uh, uh, um, interest and now they're dra- dragging the whole world into a, a potential a nuclear disaster that's the price that's the cost of what that's something that we need to say out there because this is not heard about mm. you know we hear oh the russians are ruining this the russia but in reality even recently putin said we can have peace if you accept the regions that we've taken belong to us the whole of them, not the the parts that we already have. Mm-hmm. And uh, you refuse to uh, be a part of uh, NATO, then we can have peace. From this, from the point of view of the Ukrainians now, that is a very generous offer, because what's happening is that the whole army be- is beginning slowly to collapse. We don't know if it's going to be now or in six months or a year, but it's inevitable. That's where it's going, and um, and it's. Very- they don't want to accept this mm. because of their own narrow interests. That is what the ruling class of, of Ukraine and the West is doing to Ukraine uh, today. And then, of course, we come to what, what you said, that the, the cost of war in the West, we're beginning. How, how can it be that the British government, as you say, is pledging three billion pounds a year to Ukraine indefinitely mm-hmm. for as long as they need and, pl- and plus some probably? Uh, and then it's cutting the fuel, winter fuel subsidies for hundreds of thousands of the poorest pensioners in this country. Hundreds of thousands of the poorest. 
people who are already living under the poverty uh, line, people who have nothing. I mean, state pension in Britain is nothing. It's crumbs. It's barely crumbs. And electricity and heating is extremely uh, expensive. And they're cutting the little bit of tiny handouts they were giving crumbs that they were giving to these people while they throw all this money to Ukraine, while they throw all this money into Israel and Gaza and boast about how the, how much they support, uh, support mm-hmm. it. And then you have obviously inflation. You know, inflation is not going up so much now, but prices are staying up. You know, uh, agricultural uh, grains and so on, both Russia and Ukraine are big exporters of agricultural goods. The agriculture, food prices have gone up because of that. Fuel prices have gone up because of the war in Ukraine and because of the, the, the war in the Middle East. Euro- the European industry is collapsing. German industry is collapsing because they don't have access to the cheap Russian gas they used to. Volkswagen, I just read yesterday that Volkswagen is closing its uh, factory in Wolfsburg, which is the biggest auto uh, factory in the world with 60,000 uh, workers. It's, it's, it's a technological marvel. It's a marvel of humanity that we can produce that. It's being closed down. The amount of that, you know, of, of things that this factory could produce is being closed down. The whole of the city of Wolfsburg is, is going to collapse mm-hmm. uh, if this happens. Uh, or they, you know, we don't know if it's going to close down or they're going to significantly, uh, um, reduce production. Uh, Base F, uh, a huge chemical, uh, uh, producer in, in Germany. Their sales are down 21%. They're sh- shutting down sites. Big parts of heavy in- German heavy industry and chemical industry in particular are really feeling the impact of this war. And they're shut- that Germany is being deindustrialized because of this. Millions of people stand to lose their jobs, lose their livelihoods. Wages are going to go down. And you're going to see social decay and all of the, the things that are coming. Because of this war that they insist on going. And working class people are paying for this. You know, society is falling apart because of the, and there's a working class who pays the, who pays the bill. Uh, and nevertheless, they're, they're, they're uh, pushing ahead. So what do we say is the answer? We're opposed to war. We're opposed to this war. We're opposed to the war in Gaza. Are we pacifists? Are we opposed to war as a matter of universal principle? Well, we are not in favor of war. Let's put it like that. We're not in favor of death <laughs> and destruction. Um, but we're not pacifists either because we understand that war under capitalism and under class society is a fact of life. You can't wish it away. It's determined not by the which, the goodwill of this or that individual, although the interest of this or that individual <laughs> plays a part in it. Um, but is, 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 uh, is a product of, of this particular system. And in particular, at this point in time, the, as we talked about before, is that the crisis of the system is leading to incre- in, in, increase, increasing tensions between the different powers on a world scale. You have on the one hand, US imperialism, which is bound up in all, in all sorts of crises and which is lashing out <laughs> in many ways. And then you have rising powers such as Russia, such as Russia, and uh, China and others that are trying to flex their muscles. And in between those, you have smaller powers like Israel, like Turkey, like Iran, like Brazil, uh, who don't feel this, you know, who are, who are beginning to play a much more independent role. And all of this is leading to increased instability, increased uh, conflict, and so on and so forth. But the point is that, well, you could have a peace, but any peace under these circumstances, under capitalism, would only be temporary. It means that the robbers, the gangsters who are fighting one another, they've come to some sort of an agreement. Mm. One of them might have subjugated the other one. One of them proved too strong. Or they just come to a mutual agreement to, to, to share the loot in a certain way. But within the confines of this system, it's only a matter of time before the balance of cha- forces changes again and one of them will go for, for, for the other. And for the working class, what what does peace mean? Okay, we, we're definitely in favor of peace and we don't want working class to live in war. Um, but in a peace, peace, so-called peace situation, 
the workers still remain workers. They still remain wage slaves. Exploitation remains. Uh, oppression continues. Living standards continue to decline. The war between the classes, the silent war, so to say, which is not without guns, but the, the, the silent daily class violence which takes place from the ruling class against the workers, that remains. And the only solution is is not to fight for some sort of a imaginary fantasy fairy tale peace within the system. That's impossible. But it's to, to, to draw the conclusion from all of this that the whole system has to go. Mm. That's what we're seeing. When we see, when we look at all of this stuff that we talked about today, Zelensky, uh, Netanyahu, Biden, Stammer, you think to yourself, is it a coincidence that we just have a whole series of imbeciles and idiots and jokers and clowns and psychopaths and so, well they're always psychopaths that's that's, that's not necessarily <laughs> so they're always psychopaths up there. but the the degeneration the mental cognitive degeneration which exists mm-hmm. at the top of capitalist society in particular in the west is that is that a, 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 a just a coincidence I think it's not. It reflects a senile system. Mm. It reflects a senile regime. Mm. It reflects the senility, first of all, of U.S. imperialism, which is the biggest imperialist force on the planet, which has its tentacles into every single country, yeah. and in particular in the West. And how it's and how it's is falling apart, and um, you know that is losing its position is. You know, after after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it ended up the sole superpower on the uh, on the planet, and it thought it could do everything. You know, with great arrogance comes sorry. What is it? With with great power comes great arrogance. Mm. It waded into one country, country after it broke up uh, uh, Yugoslavia. It waded into Iraq. It waded into Afghanistan. They thought they could do anything, but slowly they realized that everything has a limit. In Afghanistan, they were defeated. They weren't. They didn't admit it. it. took them 20 years, but they were defeated heavily. In Iraq, they were defeated. Their limits began to become more and more visible to everyone. And they were engulfed in all of these crises. But a layer of the ruling class is refusing to accept this. You know? And it's in their interest. The most rational point of view, the most rational way to, re- to act in America, from from an American imperialist point of view, just to maintain the U.S. imperialism would be to make tactical withdrawal, withdrawal, realizing that this is not the not the the way to do things. Make a deal with Russia, pacify Russia, make a deal with the Iranians, pacify the Iranians, focus on China, who is their real enemy. This would be the rational way of going about it. But they do the opposite. They believe, no, we cannot accept any defeat any form of defeat any any sign of weakness is so that's a, that's an extremely simplistic way of way of looking at it it's an idiot idiot how uh, idiotic way of way of looking at it and instead they think no if we just double down double down our promises double down on our alliances then we can win one of these and then mm. show everyone that's how but it's but they're not going to win they're not gonna. They're not gonna win in in uh, Ukraine. They've lost. Russia is outproducing the whole of the West in military equipment. They have. Russia now has the biggest and most battle hardened army in the world. Far more battle hardened and battle ready uh, than than the American army and any other army. And a military industry industrial complex is completely geared to war. The Americans have come out of this. Uh, will come out of this extremely weakened. And in the Middle East, they're all, they're also gonna they're also gonna lose one way or another. They're not gonna come on top of the, uh, come out of this on top. But what they're doing is that they are dragging down the whole of the world with them, and that really shows what we always what Marx said, what Rosa Luxemburg said, Engels said, socialism or barbarism. That's what that's what humanity faces. On the one hand, you have you know these incredible marvels of humanity of industry of technology which could solve all of the problems that humanity faces you know um it's being used on the arms industry 2.4 trillion dollars a year it's yeah. being used on the arms industry 
Whereas with, I think it's with 400 billion, you could solve world hunger and world poverty. Mm. <laughs> and then you would still have two, $2 trillion dollars left. All of these factories, all this industrial capacity that could be used to produce goods that are beneficial for humanity is being used for, to, to build these extreme machines of, uh, of this destruction. And that is the choice in front of humanity. Socialism or poverty. You can use these, you can overthrow the system and use what is created to create a paradise on earth or you can let these guys drag us down with them. Uh, and, and, and it shows that, you know, that this is a class which is completely, its existence is incompatible with the future existence of, of, of humanity, uh, actually. Well, I think that's a very sober and appropriate note to end the discussion on. And I just want to draw everyone's attention to our main statement, the statement with which we launched this uh, campaign against militarism and imperialism i'll put the link in the description and just to echo what hamid said it doesn't have to be like this war isn't something that humanity is necessarily condemned to it's a product of a sick system that hasn't always existed and that we can do away with but we can't do it alone as ever the purpose of these discussions on the one hand is to educate and to inform our listeners our comrades our supporters but it's also to encourage you to join us. You need an organization if you're serious about fighting for a better world. The Revolutionary Communist International organizes in about 60 countries worldwide. As ever, there are links in the description where you can find out more about joining us and I implore you to do so. Read about the campaign. We'll be putting out loads of material over the next period. We have already actually, but we'll keep doing into the coming weeks and months about the wars, about the terrible crimes of imperialism, and also will be producing historical material, looking at the history of the communist position on various wars. We'll be putting forward our program, what we would do instead, what we would invest in rather than instruments of death that at best rust away in a factory somewhere, and at worst are used to kill workers and destroy infrastructure. We'll be talking about all of that on our website, marxist.com, and we'll be having future episodes in this season with a particular focus on the question of war, the communist position in opposing war, and explaining why we say that for humanity to have a lasting peace and to have a dignified existence, we need to do away with capitalism and lay the basis for socialist reconstruction and a communist future. But with that, we'll call it an end to this episode. I hope that you learn as much as I did. Uh, Hamid, thank you once again for joining us. It's always really informative having you on the show. Thank you, Joe. We're back to weekly episodes, so I will see you in a week's time. Solidarity. Solidarity.